The retroactively manufactured evidence against Brian Koberger can be summed up in about four categories. Dylan's description, CCTV footage that apparently shows his vehicle in the vicinity, touch DNA, and cell phone GPS data, the latter of which we'll be covering today. Koberger and his attorneys submitted additional information and corroboration for his alibi on the night of November 13th, 2022. It reads as follows. Mr. Koberger moved to Pullman, Washington in June of 22. As an avid runner and hiker, he explored many areas of the Palouse. Of note, he explored Wawahi Park in July of 22, and this became a favorite location. After the school year began, Mr. Koberger was busy with classes and work at WSU, and his running and hiking decreased, but Koberger's phone shows him in the countryside late at night and or in the early morning on several occasions. The phone data includes numerous photographs taken on several different late evenings and early mornings, including in November, depicting the night sky. Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13, 22, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. He drove throughout the area south of Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including Wawahi Park. Mr. Koberger intends to offer testimony of Cy Ray, cell tower, cell phone, and other radio frequency expert to show that Brian Koberger's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington and west of Moscow, Idaho on November 13th, 22. That Brian Koberger's mobile device did not travel east on the Moscow-Pullman Highway in the early morning hours of November 13, and thus could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow-Pullman Highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop. Additional information as to Mr. Koberger's whereabouts as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis by Mr. Ray, will be provided once the state provides discovery requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. If not disclosed, Mr. Ray's testimony will also reveal that critical exculpatory evidence further corroborating Mr. Koberger's alibi was either not preserved or has been withheld. If you'll recall, the probable cause affidavit places Koberger's cell phone at his residence at 2.42 a.m. and at 2.47 a.m. driving through Pullman, Washington. It's at this point that the phone stops reporting to the network. The cell phone reportedly comes back online at 4.48 and pings at Blaine, Idaho, near U.S. Highway 95. A couple minutes later, near Genesee, then Uniontown, and then finally arriving back at Pullman between 5.25 and 5. 27 a.m. As such, we have a lack of information as to the whereabouts of the Koberger cell phone from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m. We'll call these the dark hours. Just to contextualize this time frame from what's going on at campus, Koberger's phone stops reporting at 2.47. Kaylee and Maddie make their last call to Jack at 2.52, and one minute later, the body cam footage for the underage drinking encounter clicks on. Despite all this activity within a couple hundred feet of the murder scene, they narrow in on Koberger's vehicle, which apparently enters the neighborhood at 3.30. However, the closest his cell phone places him to the crime scene is about 10 miles away near Blaine, Idaho at 4.48 when his phone turns back on. 
The PCA specifically cites the route of travel in the early morning hours and the lack of the phone reporting to AT&T during the dark hours is consistent with Koberger attempting to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide. I have quite a few problems with this statement. Essentially, they're using a lack of evidence as evidence of murder. And they make a major logical leap here that just because there was no pinging of his phone, that that means that Koberger is attempting to conceal his location. Despite the fact that his cell records never show him traveling to Moscow on that night, and they twisted that to make it inculpatory. There is no evidence that Koberger put his phone in airplane mode or that he turned it off. That is simply the state's theory that they're projecting onto the defendant based on the lack of reporting from the cell phone. The Idaho statesman did a really great piece back in February of 23, much closer to the time when the affidavit was released. They spoke with a telecommunications expert named Ben Levitan about the cell phone towers in the area and what these pings could suggest about the murders. Quote, Levitan said that it's impossible to know for sure that Koberger turned off his phone unless someone called him during the two-hour period and the call record showed that his phone went straight to voicemail. He added that if someone's phone isn't showing up on the network, all it means is that they didn't receive any calls or texts or use any apps during that time period. Levitin said that cell phone records are completely reliable, but that authorities tend to overplay them. He added that cell phone records could help exclude suspects by showing they weren't within a tower's coverage area. But, Levitin said, when someone does show up in the coverage area of a cell tower, it doesn't mean they were at the scene of the crime. Cell phone records, as evidence, are very reliable and useful, but it's not DNA, Levitin said in a follow-up email. It doesn't have the precision that would allow you to pinpoint a person's phone. The best the state can say is that this phone was in a 27-square-mile area that includes the crime scene 12 times, referring to the supposed stalking leading up to the incident. The telecommunications expert even provided a map of the registered cell towers in the area, and there appears to only be two. This map shows that if Koberger was driving south of Pullman and west of Moscow, he very well could have been picked up by the cell tower that also services the King Road home. This information, to me, makes that conclusion that a lack of cell phone pings equals concealment of a crime even more ridiculous. Essentially, a lack of reporting could simply be that he never used an app and never received a phone call or text message during that period. Maybe he was at Wawahi Park, where some reviews suggest that there isn't good cell service. I see a lot of mainstream media, talking heads, as well as YouTube commentators scoffing at Koberger's alibi showing weather reports that night that, oh, it was cloudy, you couldn't have possibly seen the moon and stars. But let me remind you, stargazing is not his alibi. Rather, his alibi is that he was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. The alibi is not that he was hiking, running, or seeing the moon and stars. That is something that he claims he liked to do, and he was out driving that night. The defendant is prepared to offer proof that this is not abnormal behavior from him in the form of expert testimony as to his cell records, and apparently there are some pictures from his phone that show this activity. Brian also had a Strava account, which is an app that runners, hikers, and bikers use to log their location and routes of travel. This entry shows that on August 4th of 22, at 12.45 a.m., after midnight, Brian went for a run in Pullman, partially corroborating his claim that, yes, he did like to go out and run at night in the dark. There's also an incident that happened at Brian Koberger's apartment that very night that I spoke about in a recent video. I'll insert a clip right here. On the night of the murders, there was a hit and run on WSU's campus right next to Brian Koberger's apartment. The crash occurred at the Grove Apartments, which is just next to the Steptoe Apartments where Brian lived. At 11.30 p.m. on Saturday night, 19-year-old WSU student Carmen E. Fernandez hit two pedestrians, a male and a female, as well as a fire hydrant after driving under the influence of alcohol. She fled the scene thereafter. 
The author of While Idaho Slept described this as a much more involved scene than I had previously thought and definitely changes my perspective of what was going on by the apartments on the very night in question. Quote, at approximately 11.40 p.m., a 19-year-old Kappa Delta sorority member with a high blood alcohol level with her sister and her sister's friend in the car lost control and drove into a fire hydrant, a street light, and two pedestrians, both of them badly injured. The girl then drove away from the bloody scene. Tenants at the complex where the accident occurred could hear the screams. The victims, reportedly students at WSU, lay scattered like broken tree limbs. It was horrifying, a 26-year-old witness told reporters. The Washington State University police arrived soon after, along with deputies from the Whitman County Sheriff's Office. The hydrant collision had caused a water line to rupture and that it had to be dealt with as well. The two victims were taken to Pullman Regional Hospital in serious condition. Police began an all-hands-on-deck manhunt for the driver. According to Brian Koberger's cell phone records, he was in his apartment when the crash occurred. The flashing police lights soon lassoing across the exterior walls of nearby buildings. There had been a large police presence while he was at home. The crime scene had to be managed and streets cordoned off and several squad cars patrolled the area looking for the perpetrator of the hit and run. Paramedics in the fire department had also arrived. This was a big scene. The scene was active until shortly after 5.30 a.m. Did you hear that? This was an active crime scene that was still being cleaned up when Koberger returned, allegedly. The police were there the whole time, said Jose Mercado, a student who could see both Koberger's building and the accident scene from his apartment. Whatever Koberger had done, he'd left and returned within eye shot of law enforcement. I believe that Ann Taylor is being purposefully and strategically vague to preserve the defendant's alibi from being meddled with by the state, as they tried to do with his DNA genealogy expert by sending FBI agents to her house following her testimony in open court. The defense doesn't care if corrupt agents like JLR and Gray Hughes think Koberger's alibi is sufficient or not. They are wisely keeping their cards close to their chest. The prosecution has been withholding evidence for a year and a half now. They have yet to disclose to counsel how the defendant was even identified by law enforcement in the first place. So-called courtroom courtesy is way out the window by now. Ann Taylor knows that even though Thompson has the judge in his back pocket, he's getting desperate as the defense team picks apart their case with the precision that the investigation utterly lacked. I'll remind you, though, it's Ann Taylor and her team's job to exonerate their client, not necessarily to solve this case or present the truth as to what happened to Maddie, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan that night. I suspect that she will, though, leaving no doubt that this event involves many more suspects and likely a tangled network of organized crime. As for the exoneration of Koberger, I personally believe that this WSU hit and run accident is the likely X factor in the defense's case for two main reasons. One, it makes the state's lone killer theory that much more unbelievable. The state is asking us to believe, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Brian Koberger left his apartment at 2.42 a.m. on a Saturday night in November, drove to King Road to kill these four people he has no connection to and no identifiable motivation to commit such an extreme act, that he had the state of mind to turn his phone off during the act, but decided to turn it back on when he was on his way home, that he took no blood or DNA of the victims with him, but carelessly left behind his knife sheath with a conveniently placed single source of touch DNA. That he was even seen in the home by a witness that chose not to do anything for eight hours while her roommates bled out in their bedrooms. If you're willing to buy this narrative, you must also reason with the fact that this so-called killer chose to embark on this homicidal mission while an active police investigation was occurring right outside his apartment. You must accept that Brian was willing to risk being spotted by police when leaving and returning from committing this motiveless massacre. The second reason I believe this accident is a key factor in the defense's case is that it makes the defendant's alibi logical and frankly believable. 
Despite the harsh scrutiny from controlled media, Taylor and her team don't have to prove this alibi beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the prosecution standard, remember? Anyways, I'll admit that when I first heard that Koberger was using an alibi defense and that he was conveniently driving around during the early morning hours of the 13th, I was pretty skeptical. However, knowledge of this hit and run reframes the night in question. You'll be hard pressed to find details about the incident itself. I've searched WSU police, Pullman PD, and Whitman County for a copy of the police report, activity log, or booking information, just to give some sort of narrowed down timeframe of the apprehension and arrest of Carmen Fernandez, but no luck. So you got two patients laying on the ground. What uh, response do you have medics coming? <laughs> Element 41, we've got a damaged fire hydrant. We're going to need somebody to come out from water to try to seal it off. So we had a caller call in and report that a vehicle struck two pedestrians, almost hit a third, struck a fire hydrant, and then left the scene. Uh, we had officers and obviously the ambulance respond to the scene, discovered two people that had been struck by what we determined later to be a large dark colored SUV. Those people were both transported to the hospital. I believe they should recover from their injuries. A third person jumped out of the way or they would have been struck as well. The fire hydrant, we had to have the city come shut it off. It was actually about to erode an entire hill based on the quantity of water coming out of it. There was also like a partial electrical box that had been struck. 406. 406. I located the vehicle on California Street near Monroe, Lake Washington. It's unoccupied. I've got the substantial damage, particularly front right, missing grill, as well as yellow paint transfer from the hydrant. Officers later found the vehicle involved at a different location, and we ended up arresting somebody that we believe um, conducted the hit and run, and we conducted a DUI investigation on that individual as well. To back up my statement about how this incident strengthens the defendant's alibi, I've come up with two different scenarios which I believe are both plausible and completely supported by the available evidence. The first theory I've formulated about Brian's activity and whereabouts during the dark hours, I will call the manhunt theory. It goes like this. And I'll reiterate, this was a very serious incident. We have bloodied victims with broken limbs sent to the hospital, various police departments and emergency personnel on scene investigating and tending to that burst water line. There's no doubt that if Koberger was indeed home, he certainly had knowledge of this incident, period. The scene was described as chaotic. There were eyewitnesses to that hit and run able to give a vehicle description. Again, I can't find an exact time for arrest, but Carmen Fernandez was arrested hours later when her vehicle was located on Greek Row. Let's say Koberger, an insomniac who's working on his PhD in criminology and has a somewhat familiar relationship with Pullman PD as he had interviewed at the department, comes outside to offer assistance to the officers. Yeah, if you're available, we could use some help locating the suspect vehicle. We've got officers canvassing campus and pulling security footage, but it's also possible the suspect escaped to the greater Pullman Moscow area. Would you mind driving some of these back roads to see if you can find evidence of the vehicle? Here, take my number and give us a call if you notice anything unusual. Brian hops in his car alone and as stated in his alibi, begins driving around the area south of Pullman and west of Moscow. You may ask, but why would he turn his phone off? But if you'll recall from expert Ben Levitan, a lack of reporting to a network does not necessarily prove that his phone was off. It could mean that he simply wasn't using any apps or receiving any texts or calls during that period. So he throws his phone on the front seat, turns on the radio, no need for a GPS as he's pretty familiar with these back roads and begins cruising the area. Eyes peeled for a broken down or severely damaged vehicle as described by the witnesses. But at 4.48 a.m., Koberger's phone pings near Blaine as he hypothetically could have received a call from the officers on scene. Hey man, we located the vehicle and arrested the suspect. Appreciate your help, but you can come back to WSU now. Koberger makes his way back to his apartment, arriving at 5.27 a.m., the exact same time as the scene was wrapping up. Let me know what you think of this hypothetical scenario in the comments below. The other scenario I've come up with stemming from this accident is called the date night theory. This scenario is predicated on the theory that Koberger was seeing a girl from University of Idaho. 
We know he used Tinder in the past and was apparently in the area of campus 12 times prior, according to the state's affidavit. This can be explained by a relationship with somebody on Idaho's campus. Let's say he was spending the night in his apartment with a girl on November 13th. This accident happens pretty late around 1140. Sirens, lights, chaos prevents the couple from sleeping. They decide to go for a drive to Wawahi Park, a favorite location, and where there is, quote, absolutely no cell service. The two spend a couple romantic hours relaxing at the park, maybe smoking a little, looking at the stars before returning to the apartment to catch some sleep. They wake up the next morning around 9 a.m. and Koberger courteously drives her back to Idaho's campus and then runs some normal Sunday grocery errands. I ask you, is this scenario more plausible than inexplicably returning to the scene of the quad homicide he supposedly committed five hours earlier? Some of you may consider these theories I've presented far out there, but I submit to you that it's the prosecution's theory that is outlandish, full of oddities, and most importantly, not proven by the flimsy evidence presented thus far. In my opinion, this is why they are demanding the defense hand over more specific details on his alibi. Hence why I call this incident the X factor that the defense is keeping off the record. The alibi is that he was driving around, whether that is to help locate a suspect vehicle at large or simply getting away from the chaos unfolding in front of his building. This accident gives the defendant reasons to leave his apartment during the dark hours, thus substantiating his alibi. But, Mr. Thompson? Your Honor, it's completely unfair and unacceptable for us to get a list of witnesses with no idea what they're going to testify about. Uh, we're just, I mean, the names witnesses don't mean much of anything. And unfortunately, we're having a pattern in this case of last minute disclosures of witnesses and PowerPoints and all sorts of things that frustrates your honor's ability to assess what's going on because it's brand new to you, just like it's brand new to us. The state is utterly desperate to find out what the defense knows, what witnesses they're going to call and what evidence they're going to show. My question is to the master gaslighter, Bill Thompson, is what are you so worried about? If you have the defendant dead to rights to the point where you've incarcerated him for a year and a half, anything he's able to produce should be easily overcome by the evidence uncovered in their so-called investigation. The prosecution continues to show their utter narcissism and insecurity in the case they've built. This should scare every American. If they can lock up Koberger with this flimsy evidence and ridiculous fairy tale theory, they can do it to you too. So this should really scare all Americans. The justice system is a joke.